Well, what a privilege to give the Wolf Lecture. Like many of you here, RSVP feels to me like my intellectual home, so I really am thrilled to do this. I'm also thrilled to be speaking in this wonderful library, and I'm very excited that this, this lecture is part of the Second Saturday series run by the library. Um, and with that, I'll kick off. Um, to, there's always been too much to read. Periodical literature may be compared to a vast wilderness without form and void, its extent unknown, its ramifications unfathomed. In this undefined waste, there are indeed to be met with a few trees of a century's growth or more. These constitute the landmarks, but they are few and far between. There are indeed others of vigorous growth which claim notice on that account, but the great mass lies like an indefinite scrub or undergrowth, <laughs> lacking individuality, presenting no features of identity. This is Cornelius Wall, Wolford setting out his scheme for a dictionary of periodical literature in the Bibliographer in 1883. Wolford's plan was to map this wilderness, producing a catalogue that would detail every single periodical ever published. This lecture is, in many ways, a tribute to such dreaming. <laughs> Wolford has a place in the history of RSVP. As many of you will also know, these words were quoted by Michael Wolfe in the opening to his landmark essay, Charting the Golden Stream, Thoughts on a Directory of Victorian Periodicals. This essay originated in a 1966 conference paper presented to the annual conference on editorial problems at the University of Toronto in 1966, in which Wolfe drew attention to the riches in the archive of 19th century periodicals and the extant bibliographic problems that are involved in working with them. In the conference paper, Wolfe set out his Victorian periodicals project an attempt to compile a list of periodicals published in the period and then cross-reference this against catalogues of what survived. This work prompted the first number of Victorian periodicals newsletter edited by Wolfe and Dorothy Deering from the offices of Victorian Studies in January 1968 and then RSVP itself at the MLA in December later that year. For Wolfe, Wolford represented an important predecessor, and he advertised information about Wolford in Victorian Studies and the TLS, the Times Literary Supplement, in 1966. With nothing forthcoming, he tried again in VPN, Victorian Periodicals Newsletter, in 1971, and then published Charting the Golden Stream, republished it in the journal the following year, in 1972. By this time, work was well underway on what would become the first phase of the Victorian and Waterloo Directory of Victorian Periodicals, 1824 to 1900, edited with Deering and John North and published in 1976. Work on the Waterloo Directory continues, of course, and we've been lucky to have John North here with us at this conference. The periodical literature is no longer a wilderness without form and void, is due to projects such as his. Scholars of periodicals don't need Darwin, or dare I say Derrida, to tell us that origins are fraught things. Despite the confidence with which periodicals label themselves, volume one and issue one, we know that such declarations can mask a longer history and that the issues to come may not resemble uh, their progenitor. In the spirit of the periodical itself then, I don't offer Wolford as a point of origin for our scholarly field. Rather, I want to use him to draw attention to the way that the study of 19th century periodicals has always been intertwined with attempts to assert control over their troublesome remains. Origins might mark beginnings, but they depend on where we look and what we find and when we decide to stop. In what follows, I set out some of the ways that periodicals behave like archives while at the same time a subject to archival control. My lecture's in two parts. In the first, I consider the way that periodicals function as a record, before turning to the way this archival function causes problems for those that would not want to archive them. In the second, I look in more detail at systems of cataloguing and indexing that attempt to put periodicals in their place. Throughout, my argument is that archival materials are entangled within the institutions that preserve them and the information technologies that make them visible. This has always been the case, 
but it's a lesson we're learning anew uh, as we, in, in the wake of the way, many ways that we encounter Victorian protocols in digital form. My interest in technologies of bibliographic control is rooted in the way that digital tools allow us to reconceive the field, whether this is by searching across it in novel ways or transforming it into structured data that reveals different things about press and period. And this context runs throughout the lecture, and I address it explicitly in conclusion, but it also runs throughout the history of our field. Meryl Distat's account of the early days of Victorian Periodicals Review notes that the opening panel of the very first RSVB conference featured a paper on using computers for bibliographic work. For this society, the study of print culture has always been intertwined with digital tools and methods. For us, they're not new media. Now, as Aileen, Aileen Fife puts it in her contribution to the Cambridge history of the book in Britain, printing technologies were information technologies. And it's in this broader history, encompassing both print and digital, that I want to situate the periodical. What I call bibliographic utopianism are those dreams of archival order in which everything is counted and given a place. And this, of course, is an impossible fantasy. No classificatory scheme can ever fully encompass what it describes, and the coherence of any collection depends on what remains uncollected. Yet bibliographic utopianism is something to be celebrated. A desire founded on a necessary lack, bibliographical utopianism is the drive responsible for all those attempts to bring the archive under control. And by tracing the contours of this desire, and crucially the way that it's never satisfied, the way its products always fall short of its totalizing vision, we can understand the way the archive was imagined, how its contents relate to one another, for instance, and how they might be used. And this is where the bad indexer comes in. <laughs> the periodical press not only constituted one of the major bibliographical challenges for the period, it was in its pages the responses to this challenge were also discussed, characterised by abundance and repetition, with no issue, volume or title standing alone. This is a field that can only be mapped by abstractions. Examining how Victorian fantasies of the archive came up against what was possible reveals much about what they thought there was to be saved and what might be safely forgotten. It also reminds us, as we build new data sets with which to reconstitute the field, that historical knowledge results from the broken dreams of perfect recollection. Okay, the periodical in the archive. So in his book, The Theory of National and International Bibliography, from 1896, Frank Campbell, then an assistant to the British Museum, defended the bibliography of periodicals in what are to us familiar terms. Michael Wolfe memorably called periodicals, and I quote, repositories of the general life of Victorian England. For Campbell, periodicals, and I quote, constituting the chief medium of national progress, reflect the daily life and thought of a nation in a manner which other books are capable of. I like the square quotes around <laughs> books. <right? laughs> in instituting, he continues, therefore, an exact record of what the world is thinking about, we not only aid and hasten that progress for all time, but we hand down a true record of the same to the future historian and thus perform one of the chiefest duties entrusted to us as librarians. Now we too value periodicals because of what they reveal about the past. The diversity of the periodical press restores debate, the diversity of voices, the market, while its seriality restores a temporal texture that's all too easily flattened out retrospectively. When we turn the pages of Victorian periodicals, it's impossible to escape the knowledge that there are many truths at many times. Campbell knew that an archive of these serial archives was an invaluable cultural heritage. However, he was unwilling to countenance that the bibliographical record might also constitute just one truth amongst others. With their continuous pagination, stretching on beyond the issue, and terminating only with the book-like closure of the volume, periodicals exert archival form. Regardless of what happens to any individual issue, peri the periodical imagines a reader coming back when it has become part of a larger whole and accessing it, database-like, through the apparatus 
of index and contents. The periodical, as a genre, imagines a reader coming back like us. And to be a periodical was, in many ways, to imagine this future reader. The Philosophical Transactions, I thought I'd better mention this in the Science Library, uh, founded in 1665, conceived of itself as an ongoing useful repository of information, and it provided an index from the outset by which it might be searched, volume at a time, in future. This was rapidly lampooned, and publications such as the Transaction Era, 1700, and Useful Transactions in Philosophy, 1708-9, I love the sarcasm, mocked both the tone of the philosophical transactions and its bibliographic apparatus. It was not just natural philosophy. The Gentleman's Magazine uh, included contents pages with every monthly issue, and an index at the end of the year from its foundation in 1731, and I know I haven't got an image of that one, I've got 1736, but it's close enough. <laughs> and it was not just periodicals, as Michael Harris has pointed out, early newspapers such as the London Evening Post also issued volume title pages, and some provincial weeklies had continuous pagination running through a volume well into the 19th century. Um, I haven't got that. I was going to show an example here of a newspaper called the Liverpool Mercury, which uh, ran continuous pagination after it was founded in 1811. But then from July 1845, it added a second pagination sequence in the issue. So it's paginating itself both for a volume and for an issue at the same time, before it abandoned the continuous pagination in 1853. But I've got another example. The Tenby Observer, which was founded in 1853, numbered off issues and volumes for a newspaper, right, which is unusual. And it continues to do this today. However, in the early 19th century, the expectation of archival life, of being bound to be bound, became identified solely with the periodical. Newspapers instead restarting pagination in every issue. And this isn't to say that newspapers were not considered records. The newspaper had long been recognised as the only written record of speeches, whether in Parliament or elsewhere. And the demanding white spaces of the newspaper meant that editors were particularly attuned to those institutions that could produce a ready stream of news. And this meant that the newspaper often served as an unofficial institutional record. Samuel Palmer, for instance, claimed that his index to the Times was, and I quote, uh, the only register of criminal cases in existence. The same remark applying to suicides, inquests, and accidents. For W.T. Stead, it was the newspaper's proximity to the everyday that allowed it to be, and I quote, a page from the book of the life of the town in which it appears, a valuable transcript of yesterday's words, thoughts, and deeds. There are even newspapers that made this archival function their market niche. Founded in 1871, the week's news advertised itself as, and I quote, a trustworthy guide to the comprehension of passing events. It excluded everything other than news, so it might be preserved in libraries and reading rooms, while also appealing to, and I quote, the gentleman who wants a newspaper to file in his library. The newspaper exemplified something that was common to the periodical too, as date stamp commodities, both end-stopped and open-ended, as Margaret Beetham put it, newspapers and periodicals were peculiarly attuned to the present, while at the same time acknowledging that moment would pass. The difference was that periodicals wrote the possibility of an archival afterlife into their form, regardless of whether or not they were actually kept. For Alien Fife, what was distinctive about industrial printing was not, and I quote, the creation of a new information product, but in the transformed role and position of printed information in society. Newspapers and periodicals were key informational genres. Their proliferation appeared to correspond to the increase in what there was to be known. Their seriality meant that they were endlessly capacious, and their timeliness seemed to yield information in the moment. However, in embodying information and its flow, newspapers and periodicals also acknowledge their insufficiency as media. While the reassuring edges of the paper and the existence of the last page implied that the world could be mastered just for a moment and would look reassuringly the same in the future, readers knew they were reading one particular issue of one particular publication in one particular edition. 
They also knew all too well that not everything was written down, that newspapers and periodicals existed as important nodes in a much broader informational economy. Poised then between uh, a control, an assertion of control, and an acknowledgement of excess, newspapers and periodicals could not but propagate information, even as they stored it up. And it wasn't just information. Newspapers and periodicals registered the complexity of the world, breaking it into digestible parts. But in doing so, they also contributed to the things that needed to be counted, to be sorted and distributed, made available for readers in the present and archived for, the, archived for those like us still to come. So recognised as important records of transient information, the question was how newspapers and periodicals were to be preserved. Because space is limited, cultural memory is selective. What has been kept for future reading, standing in place of everything else allowed to pass away. Even in digital resources, where costs of storage are low, the size of an archive is likely to be tempered by the work required to get material into shape. Industrial Britain, and the bureaucracy it spawned demanded new forms of institutional memory. In turn, these new institutions transformed what it was possible to recall. And in my notes here, it says, don't mention the Public Record Office. But the Public Record Office, <laughs> right? That's the paradigmatic example, but I'm not going to tell you any more than that. Uh, over the course of the period, it was the British Museum, this is where we're going, that became the institution responsible for exerting control over print. Newspapers and periodicals were part of its founding bequests. But early in the 19th century, steps were taken to obtain ongoing publications. Periodicals through the 1815 Copyright Act and newspapers through an agreement with the Stamp Office in 1822. It was under uh, Antonio Panizzi, keeper of printed books from 1837, however, that the collections really began to grow. Panizzi advocated an inclusive collections policy and he pursued it aggressively. This was particularly the case for newspapers, which he believed belonged in a national collection because you couldn't rely on them accumulating in any private collections. From 1832, the Stamp Office had begun to send provincial papers, but Panizzi also arranged for Scottish and Irish papers to come from Edinburgh and Dublin. And he also obtained funds to obtain papers from the colonies and elsewhere abroad. In addition to expanding the newspaper collections, Panizzi also pursued publishers of periodicals shirking their responsibilities under copyright law. There were some judicious prosecutions. And he also made attempts to increase the holdings of periodicals published by learned societies. It was at this time, too, that periodicals were separated from the main collection in the British Museum. After, mu after moving into their new buildings in 1840, the collections had been arranged into presses roughly by subject. In 1851, periodicals gained their own press mark, PP, and their own subject classifications. Those published by learned societies were separated off in the 1860s, this time with the press mark AC for academies. And if you use the British Museum, British Library's collections, you'll be familiar with these press marks. Minitzi's greatest triumph, though, was the reading room, uh, the new reading room in the heart of the museum, uh, surrounded by what was known as the Iron Library that, that surrounded the dome in, in the quadrangle. The total holdings of the museum had increased from 235,000 volumes in 1838 to 435,000 volumes 10 years later in 1848. The Iron Library had space for 1.3 million volumes. Nonetheless, the trustees began to eye the newspapers, in particular, warily. <laughs> this is a terrible graph. I haven't got enough data points. I know this, right? <laughs> but you get, you, get the, you get the idea. As you can see, the amount of newspapers taken each year grew exponentially with the repeal of the taxes of knowledge, and then they increased at a pretty steady rate. Right? And the, the problem is that one of my data points is too far along, so it looks like the trend is steady, but I want to draw attention to the... Right. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, they grew exponentially after the repeal of taxes and knowledge, and then uh, increased steadily onwards uh, to the end of the century. By 1873, the museum was binding over 1,500 volumes of newspapers a year. The total newspaper collections numbering 27,500 volumes. 
To put this in perspective with regards to the rest of the collection, in 1875, the museum received just under 30,000 items in one year, 1875. 18,000 of this 30,000 items were issues of periodicals or part issues. That's quite a lot already, but they received 116,000 issues of newspapers in that year. Earl Stanhope, one of the trustees, had suggested reducing the intake of provincial papers in 1862, and he did so again in 1869. That year, the subcommittee on printed books, the group that managed the library, recommended passing the collection off to someone else entirely. Uh, however, the removal of the natural history collections between 1880 and 1883 opened up some space, while the opening of the White Wing in 1885 gave newspapers, for the first time, their own dedicated reading room. The collections, uh, that's down the bottom here, uh, the White Wing, uh, and the reading room's at the back here. The collections, however, continued to grow. And in 1897, the principal librarian, Edward Morn Thompson, reported that there was only room for 1896's London papers and half of 1895's provincial papers. The museum was full, in other words. It was receiving just under 3,500 volumes of newspapers a year. And so a more drastic solution was required. The British Museum Bill of 1900 proposed dispersing the provincial newspaper collection to local councils. Uh, only retaining the London papers and the provincial papers before 1837 in the British Museum in Bloomsbury. It also proposed destroying what it described as valueless printed matter. Blank books, diaries, trade advertisements, greetings cards, children's toy books, single sheet tracts, songs, and, gird your loins, folks, most worryingly, odd parts periodicals. <laughs> The uproar that resulted prompted a £100,000 grant from the Treasury to build storage that would last 30 years, and crucially, the legislation that would allow this storage to be outside Bloomsbury. Collindale, which Michael Harris called the Siberia of the newspaper collection, <laughs> was born. I don't know what Michael Harris makes of Boston Spa, if, if Collindale is the Siberia of the, of the newspaper collection. Okay. Um, Frank Campbell thought bibliography compensated for, man, for humanity's fallen nature. Okay. It does not require much experience or imagination, he writes, to know that the whole world, visible and invisible, exists in connection with law and order, implying a certain classification of all that is or has been. Nor does it require much expertise to know that the mind of man can only imperfectly discern the order that exists, and that, the and, that, and that the difficulties of logical perception are increased, one, by the fact of the perpetual natural intermingling of all that man is conscious of, and two, by the fact that man himself adds to his own difficulties by, an unnaturally, uh, by unnaturally confusing the different parts of existence with one another. So for Campbell, the task of bibliography was to remedy such man-made confusion, and so complementing the natural sciences, restore law and order, and make clear all that is and has been. The newspaper collections in the British Museum, though, invert this model. Rather than organize content to reveal underlying order, its librarians achieved a semblance of order, regardless or despite unruly material. An article in Sell's Dictionary of the World's Press in 1892 described the newspaper collections before they were exiled to Siberia, uh, to Collindale. Along the corridor in the White Wing that led to the reading room were the volumes of London newspapers. The rest of the collection lurked down below in the basement of the Iron Library in the main museum proper. There, under the grated floor, presses lined the inside and outside of the corridor that ran around the reading room. Out of the lift and to the right was the earliest provincial paper, the Stamford Mercury from 1718. As papers were shelved by year, walking clockwise round the dome told the story of the press, registering the appearance of new titles, shifts in format, and of course the ever-increasing amounts that were published. Each one of the presses in the British Museum was four feet long with three shelves. By 1842, each year's newspapers occupied two presses. By 1860, each year's newspapers occupied six presses. 
by 1870, 10 presses, by 1889, almost 20 presses a year. However, once you got to 1878, you found yourself back at the Stanford Mercury again. Space had run out, causing, and this is on quoting cells here, a great overflow, if it may be so described, onto the four angles formed by the dome. Encircling the dome and then spilling out into the quadrants, the newspaper collection represented the uneasy truce between bibliographic control and the exuberance of the press. Michael Harris again has described the newspaper collection as, and I quote, a sort of Frankenstein's monster of the library. Its cumbersome bulk, he continues, cobbled together out of imperfect materials and finally lurching towards a separate existence, was never fully under the control of its creators. There was nothing natural about the system, no underlying order to be revealed, just librarians creatively producing form from the promptings of an anarchic print culture. Like the periodical or newspaper itself, the shelved collection offered a provisional structure laid out in advance that dared suggest that it could, could accommodate anything demanded of it. However, again, like the periodical uh, and like the newspaper, such order was only ever temporary. Solutions often had to be improvised, and there were many other ways that the material could be arranged. Okay. This brings me to the second half. Bibliographic control, which has a question mark in my script, but I obviously didn't put it on the slide. I was more confident when they were doing the presentation. <laughs> Uh, okay, bad indexes are everywhere, wrote Henry Wheatley in his book, How to Make an Index, in 1902. <laughs> Wheatley was assistant secretary at the Society of Arts, but he was also a prolific author and the editor of The Bibliographer, that journal that published Cornelius Wolford's plan for a dictionary of periodicals in 1883. How to Make an Index had been prompted by what Wheatley thought was a belated recognition of bibliographical work. There has been of late years, uh, he wrote, a considerable change in public opinion with respect to the difficulties attending the making of both indexes and catalogues. It was once a common opinion that anyone without preparatory knowledge or experience could make an index. That that opinion is not true is amply proved, I hope, in the chapter on the bad indexer. <laughs> Now, this chapter offered numerous examples of, the, of sloppy indexing in order to show how it shouldn't be done. And I'm not so interested in the ins and outs of good and bad indexing, although it is kind of fun. Rather, what interests me about such discussions is how they acknowledge the paratextual nature of bibliographic tools. Indexes and catalogues and weekly ranges across both aren't natural representations of whatever they represent, nor are they simple descriptions or distillations of content. Rather, they're crafted objects with their own aesthetics and their own politics, created from a, a discrete body of material that they write anew. Okay. In the space between the good and the bad index, then, are a host of different interpretations of what constitutes the archive, what it is, and what it might mean. Bad indexes are everywhere. Right? But if the examples from uh, Wheatley's book, uh, the chapter of the bad indexer, if the examples there are to be believed, the bad indexers are most often to be found producing the indexes to periodicals. <laughs> Wheatley drew heavily uh, for his examples on an earlier piece by Eliza Hetherington called The Indexing of Periodicals, How Not to Do It, uh, <laughs> published instead as Index to Periodicals uh, and in the Review of Reviews of 1893. Hetherington, as many of you know, was Stead's long-standing collaborator on his indexing projects, and for Wheatley, one of the most foremost indexers of the day. And just as an aside here, um, Wheatley is really willing to credit uh, Hetherington uh, as, as, as I said, one of the foremost indexers of the day. Um, but in the chapter of the good indexer, which follows the bad indexer, what he does, instead of celebrating what is often anonymous work and increasingly feminized labor, he instead chooses to defend indexing by citing examples of well-known male writers who also produced indexes. And given that Wheatley's biographers uh, often point to the fact that they don't know what, what indexes, which indexes Wheatley produced because they're unsigned, it's interesting that Wheatley doesn't take the opportunity to celebrate that, that kind of anonymous, unauthored writing. Uh, which is often associated with this work. Anyway, Wheatley's main com complaint about periodic 
periodical indexes was they simply index the titles of articles rather than indexing content. What he calls, and I quote, the vicious habit of trying to save trouble by cutting up the lists of contents and repeating entries under different headings. Hetherington cites a number of examples here, including the Westminster Review, uh, which indexed an article, uh, Cross Currents in Canadian Politics, under the word cross and not Canada, or even politics, actually. <laughs> Uh, it's on there, but you just have to take my word for it. Uh, at least, notes Hetherington, slightly exasperated, the Cornhill avoided this by indexing articles under every word in their titles, regardless of how relevant they were. Other publications, such as the United Services magazine, the Fortnightly Review, and the National Review, simply offered readers a list of articles indexed by author. Even here, Hetherington found odd examples. The Gentleman's magazine, for instance, uh, indexed Rudyard Kipling as if it was one word under R. <laughs> of more concern, though, that the idiosyncrasies of individual publications' indexes was their proliferation. Covering one volume of one publication's content, such indexes were useless unless the reader knew which journal to consult and what year. Accumulating indexes are little better than accumulating issues or volumes. In an archive fever of their own, these bibliographical resources themselves become subject to the logic of abundance. To manage this, some titles published cumulative indexes. Both the Edinburgh and the Quarterly Reviews published index volumes every 20 years or so. The Westminster Review issued a general index to its first 13 volumes in 1832. Blackwoods issued a general index to its first 50 volumes in 1855. The Leisure Hour published an index to its first 25 volumes, and all the year round, its first 20. Periodicals published indexes as a matter of course, they had that kind of archival investment. But there were few indexes for newspapers. The Morning Post published an index between 1847 and 1850. An annual index of the Times was produced by Jay Giddings in 1863 and 1864. And of course, Stead initiated half yearly indexes for the Pall Mall Gazette in 1884, the indexing carried out by Eliza Hetherington. Samuel Palmer's index to the Times newspaper um, which appeared quarterly from 1868, was a subject index, uh, like the others, but it was different in that it both kept pace with the times as it was published, while also working retrospectively through its back issues. It's the first time a newspaper becomes an archive, right, uh, retrospectively. Um, while the utility of this approach, opening the times up as an archive, was appreciated, commentators also remarked on the quirks of Palmer's indexing. In 1890, uh, an article appeared in Notes and Queries that pointed out a few of the strange catchwords to be found in the volume for 1870, which had just been published, including a story about two women who were both committed to prison, one for shooting a man and the other for stealing a horse. Palmer's lists the entry for this article under disgraceful acts, <laughs> suggesting that he was a bad indexer, right? <laughs> indexing articles by their titles rather than their content. So whereas the newspaper indexes were all dedicated to a single title, Poole's index to periodical literature, periodical literature enabled cross-searching. McKittrick claims, uh, uh, Dave McKittrick claims that this was the first index to periodicals. Its first edition, indexed to subjects treated in the reviews and other periodicals, appearing in 1848. The hierarchy there is really interesting. Reviews first and other periodicals. A second edition, six times the size again, appeared in 1853, but it was the third, published in 1882, and six times the size again, that established its reputation. Um, there's the second edition, and there's the third edition. Uh, this third edition, begun, by, uh, begun in 1876 by Paul and his assistant, William Fletcher, was a collaborative effort involving libraries from both the American Library Association and the Library Association in the UK. Most the American libraries, though, as Paul made very clear. Um, uh, five uh, supplements to Paul's index were issued from 1888, each covering a period of five years, and so bringing the period indexed up to 1907. Such was the position of Poole's index that it became the de facto definition of periodical literature, some American libraries making it policy to purchase every single periodical index within Poole's. So rather than the index as a subset of a larger archive, Poole's then defines the archive that it indexes. Poole's index retrospectively indexed the periodical archive, 
W.T. Stead's index to periodicals, however, was a genuine serial, each volume indexing the periodicals of the previous year. Prepared by Eliza Hetherington and her team, all women, Stead's indexes, like Paul's, were subject indexes, with the names of authors given but not indexed. Indeed, Stead credited Paul with, and I quote, the idea of a general index to periodical literature, and in 1894 tried to position his indexes as a successor to Paul's, stressing their superiority over the annual indexes produced by Paul's assistant Fletcher, and from which the five yearly authorised supplements were produced. Stead had difficulty finding a market for his indexes. As Laurel Brakers explained, they complemented his other bibliographical projects. Unlike the review of reviews, which retrospectively reviewed the month's periodicals so that readers could prospectively uh, select which to read, the annual indexes offered the whole year's periodicals as a retrospective archive. The difficulty for Stead was that readers needed access to periodicals, and that meant a library where they would be able to consult his indexes without purchasing them. As break notes, Stead increased the price for the second volume, published in 1892, from two shillings to five, and from the sixth volume, published in 1896, again to ten shillings. After the first price increase, Stead ruefully noted that, and I quote, the general public is not given to study. And so he pitched his indexes at those he thought were. Students and librarians and journalists frequent, feature frequently in his advertisements and prefaces, and so did politicians, sociologists, and historians. In 1898, still vainly trying to resist the business of selling to institutions rather than to individuals, Stead came up with a plan. Rather than have his readers go to the library, where they could consult his index for free, he would instead take the library to them. Clearly inspired by the clippings agencies and characteristic for Stead not acknowledging them, Stead proposed a service in which he would send readers any articles in which they were interested. He claimed that Hetherington indexed £100 a year's worth of periodicals. If his readers wanted to know how much money they would save, all they had to do was tot up the number of articles in the index. The scheme wasn't put into practice, and Stead, while delighting that his indexes had found their way into various prestigious libraries, drew the series to a close in 1904. As an enthusiast for indexes, you'll be unsurprised to learn that Wheatley was prone to bibliographical utopianism. He was the main force behind the formation of the Index Society, founded in 1878 and lasting till 1891. Its main aim was to codify the practice of indexing while preparing indexes to works and subjects currently without them. But... Uh, weekly, uh, for Wheatley, Palmer's Index, Paul's Index, and Stead's Indexes laid the foundations for an even more ambitious project. There was no point, argued Wheatley, in libraries producing their own classed catalogues or indexing part of their collections that might also be found elsewhere. Instead, the Index Society would produce one index for all. From a central office, surrounded by other indexes, um, our members of the society would create a kind of skeleton index that would then be populated by contributions from volunteers, right? crowdsourcing the index. This manuscript index would be available for consultation uh, until it was ready for printing and then sale. Once printed, it would be interleaved so it could receive more manuscript editions until it was time for another edition. In this index, wrote Wheatley, uh, anything, however disconnected, can be placed and much that would otherwise be lost will there find a resting place, always growing, and there pretending to be complete, he continues, the index will be useful to all, and its consultants will be sure to find something worth their trouble, if not all they may require. A published index or catalogue can only capture a collection at a particular moment, so either the collection needs to be closed with no further additions, or a further index or catalogue, a supplement or new edition, will need to be produced in future. For David McKittrick, indexes such as Palmer's register something new about knowledge in the period. Uh, Palmer's index, he writes, and I quote, insists on the passage of time and the unfolding relationship of subject matter day by day. Like periodicals, like the proceedings of learned societies, they place a new emphasis on the developing and changing nature of knowledge, not its immutable stability. The seriality of the periodical made it the perfect way to register a changing body of knowledge. 
However, as a changing body of knowledge, the periodical itself challenged the indexer. Ultimately, only a succession of revised indexes or catalogues, each one displacing the previous, could capture how what was known kept changing. And as each catalogue or index recorded a particular version of that collection, they too became historical documents and needed indexing and cataloguing. It's in the often complicated bibliographical condition of bibliographical tools that the contingent nature of historical knowledge can be read. However, if indexes can be good or bad, it meant that bibliographical tools were susceptible to rewriting even if what they indexed remained the same. In other words, even a closed collection could change as it became opened up in different ways. At the end of How to Make an Index, Wheatley, making the case for his universal index, leaves his reader with one final piece of advice. He says, always index the volumes afresh, and do not be contented with using what has been done before. For Wheatley, for Wheatley the bibliographical utopian, prior indexes recorded no history only the errors of others. If everyone indexed properly, as set out in his book, uh, if everyone indexed properly as set out in his book, it would only need to be done once. <laughs> but the fact that all indexing should be done afresh is a reminder, isn't it, that no indexes or catalogues will ever exhaust whatever it is they document. Abundance, excess, is the precondition of all bibliographical activity. Tools such as catalogues and indexes structure that abundance create difference, and so enable content to emerge. In other words, by instituting what gets left out, both outside the collection and in the spaces between entries, bibliographical tools both write a collection while leaving matter unwritten, room for others to return, and write the collection again. Bibliographical tools, then, are not only representations of a collection, but also the medium through which that collection is given form and content, through which, in effect, it comes into being. And this brings me back, finally, to Cornelius Wolford, whose ambitious plan provided the technology for a periodical archive the like of which had never been seen before. So the Dictionary of Periodical Literature was a utopian project through and through. Uh, asked, I'm just going to read a bit of that, asked, uh, do you contemplate including in your work all the mushroom growth of the present day? He answers, yes. I will draw the line at absolute completeness so far as it can be attained. Uh, when asked, sorry, I have to skip on, uh, do you intend to include the, uh, the, the aborted publications of which perhaps but one or two numbers only were published and which are forgotten by everybody? He says again, decidedly, yes. Okay, so it's, everything's going to be in there. But there was also a sense of doubt. In the first article, Wolford confessed that one of his motives in writing was that should his health or means become exhausted, and I quote, the work then already accomplished might be preserved and made available for any willing successor, and reserved until such successor should be ready to cooperate. But he had a warning, too, for uh, this willing successor, whoever they might be. In the final article, he reports that, and I quote, that the work progresses slowly in relation to its entire bulk, but I hope, uh, surely in view of ultimate completion, the range of inquiry seems to be as ever an ever-widening one, he continues and the stream of new periodicals flows on with increasing volume and force. If moments of despondency arise, they are speedily dispelled, and many a cheering word comes from afar. <laughs> the upbeat tone here right, belies the real emotional labour that has gone into the project so far, the satisfying emergence of bibliographical order from periodical chaos not sufficient to keep despondency at bay. Wolford was unsure as to the outcome of his project. He decided on the title and supposed that it should be printed eventually. He liked the idea of it being published serially, but he had no publisher in mind or any idea who might subscribe. It was his method that he thought was the real achievement and, which he, which, and what he wanted to pass on. Concerned about how individual titles would be catalogued, uh, Wolford devised printed index cards onto which information taken from the collections of the British Museum could be inscribed. There they are. Uh, Wolford slips set out space for details from frequency, page size and price to political persuasion and literary contents. A technology then to, to manage abundance, the proliferating fields at the same time registered the impossibility of recording everything about a periodical. 
Wolford kept his slips in alphabetical order on his table, and rather ingeniously, he used the British Museum request slips to create a second record, which he organised chronologically. And with his two representations of the British Museum's collections, Wolford's slips begin the dance of memory and forgetting, characteristic of bibliographic work. The slips reduce periodicals to classes, recording some aspects and disregarding others. Their arrangement on his tables, only two possible representations of the press, amongst many more. For Michael Wolf, Wolford and his dictionary constituted, and I quote, a solemn warning and a plea for tolerance. There is something, he writes, and I quote, both overwhelming and overwhelmingly attractive about periodicals research. Wolford died 18 months after his articles appeared. Soon afterwards, his house was struck by lightning and burned down. <laughs> the carefully compiled slips also presumably were consumed by flame. Even the journal. I know, I wish I could say, I, I, in the library, I found the slips. I didn't find the slips. Uh, even in the journal in which Wolford wrote, Wheatley's bibliography, it only lasted another year. What is most compelling for me about Wolford's plan is the way that it's been caught suspended at its most fluid moment. The slips, according to Wolford, were only a provisional stage. He called them accumulators of facts for future use, able to be passed to the compositor for printing, or to, but also to organise material for a fuller, more discursive account. But it's the accumulation of facts that he likes. Like a card catalogue or database, the slips are poised between the, exu the exuberant, abundant, and ever-growing periodical archive and the far-off fixity of a printed edition. Here, in a journal that no longer exists, is a plan to record the details of every single newspaper and periodical ever published. In virtual form, never realised, Wolford's project's been captured, as I said, suspended, before it enters that fallen condition that results from all dreams of bibliographical utopianism. And let me just conclude quickly. <laughs> So in, in a recent article in The Atlantic the, called The Human Fear of Total Knowledge, uh, Adrienne Lafrance uh, suggested that maybe we don't want to keep everything after all. The grandest libraries, she writes, uh, built like monstrous cathedrals, are particularly beloved. It ought to follow then that the ultimate library, an infinite library, would be revered as a utopia, especially in an age where data is seen as its own currency. But libraries have a dark side in the cultural imagination bibliographical dystopianism. The article offered a number of literary examples from the 20th century, Borges, Asimov, uh, Neil Gaiman, Liz Williams, who figured the library as something sinister, and then linked this to the sense that more and more data is aggregating at monstrous levels in places like Google, Facebook, and the NSA. It's tempting to write off bibliographical utopianism as an instance of 19th century imperialist arrogance, doubted in the fin de siècle, and then undone in the First World War but it hasn't gone away. We have mark records and open access public catalogues. Close to home, we have the Wellesley Index, the Waterloo Directory, and the Curran Index. And we continue to index and catalog, edit and archive, publish and build. As Freud knew, the real fear is not that everything is kept, but that everything that's kept can be found. 19th century bibliographical utopianism in its most confident might have dreamed of such perfect recall but the material practicalities of putting things into order meant that the reality was much more messy. Such projects could not but fail, falling short of the impossible aspirations of their progenitors. For the bibliographical utopian, all indexing was bad indexing, just some was better than others. Now there are lessons here for us as we think about the relationship between digital resources and the printed material from which they're derived. <coughs> Wheatley, Hetherington, and many others complained that indexing was considered a mechanical exercise that could be safely delegated or left in the hands of the compositor. An article in the Sassy Review from 1876 maintained that indexing was, not, was really not a mechanical business at all. It calls for careful thought, for a considerable knowledge of the subject of the book indexed, for a kind of sympathy both with the author and his readers. Likewise, the best digital work engages with the material that it digitises, whether the end result is a full-blown edition or a visualisation of some sort. The OCR-generated transcript might be our 21st century bad indexer, but we should not dismiss it because it's mechanical. After all, it's mechanism that allows us to work at scale, bringing new versions of the archive into being. <laughs> 
Even the sneaking suspicion that free text searching as a kind of cheating was anticipated in the 19th century. Wheatley objected to those who jeered at what he called indical learning. No man could know everything, he writes, ignoring women. Um, <laughs> He may possess much knowledge, much true knowledge, but there is a mass of matter that the learned man knows he can never master completely. The data-driven approaches to digital scholarship, including the various approaches to distant reading, are also a kind of indical learning. Rather than use the technology of the index to access articles or digital representations of articles, such work takes the indexes themselves, the data produced from an encounter, dare I say a machinic encounter, with non-digital material to detect patterns of scale. Such work, dealing as it does with abstraction, seems to threaten the idealist connection of mind on mind, the resurrectionist fantasy of the past come to life so cherished at the heart of humanist scholarship. However, Wheatley's point was that to work with abundant print, one needs such technical prostheses. There are things that can only be known when we take a step back. And this is where I'll finish. While it might appear that data-driven approaches operate at a level of abstraction far removed from the material itself, the possibility of the bad indexer reminds us that different bibliographical tools bring different archives into being. The bibliographic utopianism of Frank Campbell thought that systematic classification would reveal divine order, would strip away the muddle of the world, including previous attempts to make sense of it, and instead reveal the underlying truth. However, the archive is a site of abundance that exceeds our ability to master it. We might be able to catalogue a collection or index a book, but these are representations, not exhaustive renderings of their contents. Equally, when we digitise, we, we do not provide access to something that already exists, but transform that thing in the process of providing access. Rather than a fixed point of origin, a place where the authentic past dwells, we have something that comes into being as a consequence of bibliographic control. The periodical press has never been and never will be a mapped field. We will never have an archive containing all the periodicals that survive, let alone all those that have ever existed. We will never produce an exhaustive list or a perfect representation. Scholarly tools, indexes and catalogues, archives and editions don't work like this. But this doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. <laughs> Instead of an object or an archive given in advance, we have one that comes into being through our attempts to understand or model it. Bibliographical utopianism, that heady dream, believes in one archive perfectly described for all time that can let the past speak for itself. We should rejoice that our bibliographic tools do not live up to this impossible ideal, for it's in the amount that they fall short that the archive comes into being. We need bibliographical utopianism in order that it should fail. There is not one archive, but many. Thanks very much. There's there's time for a few questions. We're videotaping, so we want to get your question, uh, the audio, on, on the video. So raise your hand, and I'll come by with a microphone. All right, in the back. Just while you're doing that, I just want to thank Casey Smith, for, uh, as it was his work that turned me on to Frank Campbell, and has been very helpful in the preparation of this. And he's an RSVP who can't be with us at the moment. Hello, I'm John North of the Waterloo Directory. Uh, I want to tell you two major troubles I have had. The first one is closed access shelves. Yeah. So I was 10 stories down in the Bodleian. They told me I was the first member of the general public who had ever been allowed inside <laughs> the stacks. Then they moved a large part of their periodical holdings out of town 15 miles. I asked for access and after much difficulty they offered it. I said, where? They said, go so many miles this way, you'll hit this street, go past this street to the next lane, turn right on the lane until you find a horse in an open field, and there's a <laughs> lane there, you turn right, and then 200 feet inside that lane, you'll find us. It's very different to have open, full text e-access than to have access to the cold print. Yeah. An entirely different uh, process. However enriching is the open e-access. The second big problem 
is that in my uh, correspondence with uh, many dozens, multiplied dozens of UK libraries, depending on the online library catalogs, sending a list of the titles for which I want a title page plus the call numbers, I'm responded this way. We only have half of what you ask for, or we only have half of what is listed in our library catalogs. Yeah. That was across the board except for very tiny libraries. Those are my two problems, and I have no solutions. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, we all know from the British Museum, the British Library, that uh, destroyed in the Blitz has become a euphemism for things that have been lost. Right? <laughs> um, but but, but what, what's entrancing about that moment when you could walk around the dome, right? Panizzi's dome, which represents order, right? the, the mastery of knowledge, that, that dome at the centre of the British Museum, in, in what was, at that time, the largest library in the world. Um, and to have the newspaper collection around the dome like that, where you could walk around clockwise, Right, and tell the history, chronological history of the newspaper press. It's an alluring instance of the moment when you, you could, you could visualise the press in its totality. Right? And then they move it away, and it becomes invisible and closed. Um, but even then, I don't want to overstress that, 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 that moment of order, because you know, it's spilling into the quadrants, and they've already decided to take one edition of provincial papers by then. Right? So it's already a, just a subset of a much larger archive that will never be recovered. I just wanted to say that I'm very honored to be here because Michael Wolf was our neighbor in Amherst, Massachusetts oh, right. for many, many, many years until we moved back to Kansas City. Oh, fantastic. Um, what about uh, in this world that we now have, the increasingly globalized world, what about uh, articles, periodicals from various cultures, sometimes lost in the bliss, yeah, uh, right. made me think of things that are happening today where we're losing so many languages and so many yeah. great civilizations in many ways, yeah. or parts of civilizations. Yeah, I, I really want to stress that um, even though I'm kind of doing down this idea of the bibliographical utopian, it's a, it's a heady dream to save everything. Um, and, and we never managed to do it, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Um, uh, and it's vital that, that we do try, and we try seriously. We try to, we try to fail as best we can, right? Uh, because that's what we owe to the future. Um, uh, so, yeah, I agree. Hi, I, I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody, but I just say how wonderful uh, that was. It was just um, superb. Uh, it, it's kind of a minor question, but I kept thinking about your early point about newspapers renumber with each issue mm. in contrast to the continuous pagination of a periodical. And I'm really interested in what you think, and you would often clump newspapers and periodicals together, and yet there is also this distinction. So what, for you, are the kind of practical and maybe theoretical implications of that signal difference between newspapers and periodicals as you conceptualize archives and indexes. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Because the um, part of the way that the, the newspaper, and I'm generalizing, understands itself is as a, is a fleeting record of the present. Uh, and you know, we have newspapers of record and, and things like that. Um, and yet, f in terms of its form, it, it doesn't include the apparatus to, to constitute an archive in that respect. It's really hard to look things up in newspapers. Um, uh, Palmer's Index does it, it's, it by giving you a, a date, a page, and a column uh, to find it, which kind of works, right? It, that, it's a system that, that's manageable. So there's a tension in the newspaper between uh, a desire to capture everything, no matter how fleeting, because often the most interesting reading is the transient. Uh, that's where you know, the gossip, the, um, the things that are just there one minute that aren't there, there there's that pressure on time. You want up to date this, right? So the newspaper is a, is a record, and a record of something that, that's fleeting. Um, and it's conscious of its, its uniqueness in that respect, and yet it doesn't have that, that sense that as each issue appears, it's part of an ongoing project that will constitute something book-like, something that can be collected and then recollected afterwards. And so I, I see the newspaper as a kind of, a kind of refreshing, uh, kind of attempt to, to capture a moment that reproduces that attempt to capture a moment in its formal structures. And, and I, wondered, I wondered too whether there isn't something of a, a, a tension in journalism itself in which people uh, take a pride in writing for the moment, 
but also a kind of, not a kind of despondency, but a, a consciousness, a kind of perverse pride in, in capturing that moment to the best of your ability, knowing that it won't, won't go on, right? It'll be lost. Uh, and I wonder if the newspaper is just, is just kind of poised between uh, a dream of being archival and knowing that it can't be. Something like that. I don't know, but it's, it's a fascinating area, and I'd, I'd love to know people's thoughts on, on that. One of the few generic distinctions that's really clear between newspapers and periodicals, because as you know, there's that huge gray area, but that pagination thing seems like the clearest marker of generic distinction. Well, we have lunch waiting for us back at the Student Union, so I really wish we could continue having this fascinating discussion, um, but I will have to say this is the end. <laughs>